Well, welcome back to this special edition, again with Jay Smith, as he speaks to us in a very casual setting regarding the issue of Islam, Jihad, and what's going on in the world. And um, listen, it's very important that we understand in the West that Jihad is underway. All of the noise and all of the spin shouldn't matter to you. You should know Islamic doctrine and what's going on. There is both a overt and covert attack on the world regarding Islam coming against the West, coming against the world to establish a global caliphate. What is the nature of Islam? Why should it be combated? And yes, let's be honest, it's got to be hit hard on a military front because Islam is a theocratic, geopolitical march. But what do we do as Christians? We need to pick up this part of the battle, sharing the gospel with Muslims, exposing the fallacy of the Islamic faith. So we need to be educated and engaged. So stay tuned as Jay Smith answers our questions regarding Islam. Okay, I think it's important that we do and not only an overview, taking a look and see where Islam is right now in the world. And we're talking about the beginning of 2016, having just seen what happened in 2015, 2014, uh, with the emergence of this group called ISIS. It's the, probably the most recent of many groups that have come before that, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram coming out of um, Nigeria, Al-Shabaab coming out of Somalia. Um, Al-Qaeda, we thought, was the new man on the block. Now we have an even newer uh, group called ISIS. And it's because that has come on the world stage, suddenly everybody's woken up. And because of 9-11, uh, creating, uh, it came to America in a big way in 9-11. And then, of course, what happened in San Bernardino just a few weeks ago, uh, it's come to California in a big way. And so there's a huge confusion. Who are these people? What are these people that are, we call them radical, we call them extremists, we call them fundamentalists. There are many different ways to give the same name to the same people. And I think the best thing to do is to try to define this new group, this seeming violent, we call them barbaric a uh, group that has now come on the block and is scaring all of us. There's an awful lot of fear in the church because it doesn't seem like we can con confront this group. And the fact that it's now in our neighborhood, when we saw it live, I mean, you were, even in London, we were watching that, uh, we were watching as it was happening with the helicopters looking down as they were tracking that black vehicle. And then when they got out and they shot him there, everything was live. And I understand how you can even hear the dispatches. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get the recording yeah. of as the dispatcher as she was doing yeah. this amazing job of keeping everybody informed. That now is in our living rooms. Yeah. How do we deal with this? Because it's no longer over there. It's no longer something that's in Iraq yeah. or Afghanistan. It's right on our own streets in San Bernardino. And I think what we need to do is we need to back up and say, hold on a minute. Is this something that's new? Is this something that's just come about because of Afghanistan because of the creation of Israel in 1948, because of Iraq and the war with Saddam Hussein. Is it because of that, these geopolitical reasons? Is that why we suddenly now we have a group, this radical group uh, that suddenly has formed? And what we need to do is we need to, like, well, let's take the word radical. Let's use that mm -hmm. to define them. And that's a pretty good word. And the reason why is because radical means root. Mm -hmm. Radical number is yeah. a root number. And it's important that we probably use that word uh, because really when you want to, to define this group that is all over our news, why don't you start with that word radical mm -hmm. and say, is there something rooting in mm -hmm. this? Is there something that is foundational in what they're doing? And that's the answer. You're hearing radical, you're hearing fundamentalist, you're hearing extremist and you're hearing moderate and you're hearing liberal. Let's go and, and ask, why don't we define the words? And probably radical, as we've just done, means root. A fundamentalist is someone who goes back to the fundamentals. That's very close to radical. And I would suggest radicalists, fundamentalists are probably the two best words to use. Mm -hmm. Extremist is an emotive term. Mm -hmm. It's what you and I would like to say these people are because they seem extreme. Mm -hmm. So probably that's not the best word because from a Muslim standpoint, what these guys and gals are doing is not extreme. It's quite radical, it's quite fundamental, but it actually goes back to the very root. And let's go back to the root and let's go right back to the man that really defined Islam. And the man that really defined Islam is a man named Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah mm -hmm. was writing in the 1300s. So we're talking quite a bit, quite a few years ago, seven, eight hundred years ago. He was talking about what it meant to be a good Muslim. And he said in 1300, to be a good Muslim, you must read the Quran. You must read this book right here. Okay. 
But to understand this book, when you read it, it doesn't make much sense. You know that even in English, it goes all over the place. So how do you apply this book? To apply this book, he said, you must go back to Muhammad. Mm -hmm. So read the book, model by the man. Mm -hmm. The book and the man, the book and the man, the book and the man. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. That's all he said. Now, 200 years later, another man came onto the world stage. His name was Martin Luther in the 1500s. Mm -hmm. He was in Germany. And he was confronting the traditions that had come into the church. And he says, to be a good Christian, you must read this book, mm -hmm. modeled by another man, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Sola Scriptura was his, mm -hmm. what he said. Mm -hmm. Go back to Scripture, modeled by Jesus Christ. The book of the man, the book of the man, the book of the man. We call that our Reformation. Mm -hmm. Islam's already had its Reformation. Ibn Taymiyyah is the one that all radical Muslims, all my radical friends, all the fundamentalists over here, they all go back to Ibn Taymiyyah in 1300. That is their Reformation. You want to find out about Islam, true Islam, go back to the radicals, go back to the fundamentalists, and to see what motivates them. I think we need to be careful, and I think as Christians, we get it much quicker than anybody else. Most your secular world uh, would want the Irshad Manjis and uh, Reza Aslan and mm -hmm. also um, Majid Nawaz, they would like them to be speaking for Islam. Uh, but it's fascinating, those, just those three that we use right now as an example, none of them are invited to mosques mm -hmm. to speak. They don't, they don't have a following besides just a very few. Yet they are the ones that are given airtime mm -hmm. all the time for that very reason, because they are the assimilated, they're the sanitized version of Islam. And yet that's the Islam yeah. that is not the problem. I don't mind them. They're great. I, don't, I like to talk with them. I've been on television with uh, Majid uh, Nawaz. Mm -hmm. He's a fine man to talk to, sure. but he doesn't represent Islam. And I know that, so therefore I don't spend too much time mm -hmm. with him. It's the radicals that I have to spend more time with, because they are the ones that are growing and growing mm -hmm. and growing. Just look at the statistics to support them. Now in Britain, let me just use Britain since that's where I live, in, after 9-11 the atrocities that happened here in the United States. They did a survey in Britain to see how many people supported Al-Qaeda, and only about 15% supported Al-Qaeda in 2001. Mm -hmm. A year later, they went back to find out how many people now supported Al-Qaeda. That group that had only been 15% mm -hmm. had grown to 25%. In 2006 was the last time they did a survey in Britain, and the group that had been 15% that had grown to 25% now was 43% of all Muslims in Britain. Within five years, they'd gone from 15% up to 43%. It's now over 50%. Why? Where did they come from? Why did they change their mind? What is it they went to? The answer is very simple. They all started going back to this book. They all started reading this book for the first time mm -hmm. because they felt threatened because of Iraq. Yes, sure. certainly does. No one supports, I mean, I suggest that Iraq and Afghanistan have not affected Islam. It has. And what happens when you feel threatened? You, you go home. Mm -hmm. And where do you go home to? come back to that mm -hmm. which is familiar. Yeah, yeah. You go back to the Quran. Mm -hmm. You go back to the English translation of the Quran and you start reading it for the first time and you look and see what the Quran says. Now take a look at the Quran. You just read the first 20 chapters and there's verse after verse after verse after verse in the Quran that says when you are attacked, Surah 2, Ayah 190, do not go beyond the limits. Look at the next verse. And slay them wherever ye find them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, what do you do when you're attacked? You slay those who attack you. Mm -hmm. Surah 9, Ayah 5. Slay the unbeliever wherever ye find them. Besiege them. Lay in wait for them with every kind of ambush. Mm -hmm. What about us as Jews and Christians? Continue on in the same chapter to verse 29. Make war on the people of the book, the Ali Kitab. Surah 8, Ayah 39 says to do those, this is what you do with those who don't believe. Slay them until there is no more fitna. There is no more mm -hmm. unbelief in the land. How do you slay them? Look at Surah 47, Ayah 4. The first three verses in that chapter talk of what a believer is and what an unbeliever. So it defines a believer and defines an unbeliever. And a believer is anybody who follows Allah and follows the Prophet yeah, Muhammad. Yeah. But to those unbelievers, it says, cut off their heads. Mm -hmm. It's right there, black and white. Now can you yeah. see why Jihadi John was doing what he did? Yeah. It wasn't he was making it up. It doesn't, it, it doesn't mm -hmm. say that he had a proclivity for cutting people's head off. Mm -hmm. He was following scripture. Irshad Manjis. Um, Majin Nawaz, do not oh, go yeah. back to the Quran. They don't want to read these voice, verses, and they would rather you not read these verses. Sure. But if they don't support the book modeled by the man, then who do they support and who do they model? They support themselves, mm -hmm. modeled by themselves. I remember doing a debate with Benazar Bhutto. Mm -hmm. Benazar Bhutto used to be the Prime Minister of Pakistan. We were doing a debate in the Oxford Union. Uh, we were debating this very issue. Is Islam a religion of peace? A very good question. Now, she used to be part of the Oxford Union. She had been a president there. Her picture's up on the wall. And she got up there, beautiful woman, and she says, listen, 
If you want to know if Islam is relevant for today, look at me. I'm relevant. Mm -hmm. I walk, talk, eat, drink, sleep. I do everything you do. I live in London. I feel totally relevant. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I'm a Muslim. If I'm relevant and I'm a Muslim, yeah. then Islam is relevant. So I said to her, and when I was my turn, I said, Bibi, Benazar Bhutto, we call her Bibi. Mm -hmm. I said, Bibi, I'm so glad you feel relevant. I'm so <laughs> glad you enjoy living in London. Yeah, yeah. I'm so glad you can walk, talk, eat, eat like me. You can eat pork like I can eat pork. Drink like me, you can drink wine like I can drink wine. Are you willing to go on television right now in Pakistan and tell the whole Pakistani world you can now eat pork and drink wine because I told you you so, because I am relevant. I said, that's not Islam. That's, call it Bhutoism. Name it after yourself, but don't call it Islam. Because Islam, by definition, is modeled by a book, authorized by a book, modeled by a man. And no Muslim can eat pork and drink wine. I think it's a brilliant question you're asking. How is it we can resonate with them? How is it we can bring this group, especially Muslims, and they may be your neighbor, maybe it's people you work with, maybe somebody even in your own family who is a Muslim, and they're right now struggling because they're seeing what's happening in the news. They're seeing ISIS, uh, and they're saying, hold on, is that really true Islam? The irony is that that is really true Islam. Real Islam is what ISIS uh, epitomizes. That's hard to accept. And uh, for, you can see there's a struggle right now because there are many other Muslims who are trying to rise up and have a new narrative saying, no, 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 that's not true Islam. Real Islam is a loving, peaceful, benign, benevolent. It's, what, it's this coexist that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. The problem is they cannot find any scripture to back them up, nor can they find any example of the prophet. That's why they use their own example, like the Benazar Bhutto's of the world. She just looks at herself and says, look at me. What's interesting, and this is what I find fascinating, almost everyone who says, there is, no, there is no unique or exclusive message. We're all saying the same thing. Do you notice what they're all saying? Have you noticed? They're all saying what we're saying. Mm -hmm. Almost all the Muslims who say that's not Muhammad, I said, well, then what is, what is true Islam? Well, Muhammad is peaceful, and he's loving, and he took care of the stranger. I said, mm -hmm. you're just defining Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. They always use our categories. Mm -hmm. In fact, they, it's amazing to me in London how many Muslims tell me that they can pray to God. Where in the Quran can you pray to God? We can pray to God. They're actually mimicking in what we already do. They're all silly taking on board what we're already saying. Where do the Sam Harris's and the Christopher Hitchens get this idea that there's such a thing as taking care of the weak, the oppressed, mm -hmm. the widow? That's straight out of scripture. That's not in the Upanishads, that's not in the Bhagavad Gita, it's certainly not in the Quran, and it's certainly not in any of the, uh, of the books written by any of the greatest atheists. That is specifically and uniquely out of the teaching of Jesus Christ in Matthew 5. Mm -hmm. And that's why most of those who say Christianity is not relevant for today, I said, well then what are you doing and who are you acting and where is your model? Because in almost every case what I'm fighting is they're mimicking us. They just don't know who and the man is behind, who we are. Because it's not us that's important. It's Jesus Christ. And I've said this for 33 years. I've asked people all over the world, every Muslim I know, can you show me anything wrong with Jesus? For 33 years I've asked that question. Find one thing wrong with them, one thing that's irrelevant for today. I have yet to find anybody that's found anything wrong with Jesus. That should tell you something right there. If you really want to have peace in the world, if you really want to help your friends, if you really want to help this, your struggles from depression or all the difficulties that people are having in their lives, there's only one person I know who's already been there, who's already done that, who's already solved that, who's already waking and, and saying, come home. Come home, come home to me. Open the door, I'm sitting at the door and I'm knocking. I'm waiting for you to come to you. Because it's Jesus who was the only one that I know that heals you from the oppression. It's Jesus, the only one who already models for us what true peace is. Refusing to use the sword, not even letting his disciples defend him. Saying, that's not the answer for the world today. If you want to find true peace, you better come back to Jesus Christ. If you want to find the scripture that has all of that encapsulated into one place, you better come back to the Bible. This is it. This is the book for today. That's why it's the bestseller. It's always been this bestseller. And it's not the Old Testament I go to. This is always a big confusion. It's not the violence I go to Moses. Moses is not my paradigm. Mm -hmm. I don't go to David. I don't go to Billy Graham. I don't go to Augustine. I go to Jesus. And it's Jesus who said right in Matthew 5. He answers that question. He says, I have not come to destroy the law. I've come to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. And then he gives six different applications in chapter 5 of what he means. For you have heard it say, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I now say, turn the other cheek. Mm -hmm. Here's a whole new paradigm, a whole new law, a whole new testament. Mm -hmm. That's why we call it the New Testament. Mm -hmm. 
It's not one of violence, it's one of peace. For you've heard it say, to love your friends and hate your enemies. But then he says in verse 44, but I say to love your enemies. Ooh, I love that. What a man for today. What a man for every day. What a man for here. What a man for everywhere. Mm -hmm. He really is the man for today. And that's why in every problem, I say just let Jesus talk about Jesus. And for those of us who are Christians, forget about America, forget about Israel. Just talk about Jesus. Mm -hmm. He wins every debate. He wins every discussion. And he wins it winningly because he is one that you can't find fault with. Not at all. Mm -hmm. I can find lots of fault with Muhammad or Stalin. Pol Pot, and anybody, even the gods, uh, even Guru Nanak for the Sikhs, mm -hmm. any of the, the pantheon of three million gods for the Hindus, you can't find anything wrong with Jesus. He is as relevant in the 21st century as he was in the first century. But then why should we be surprised if he is God incarnate? Don't you think he would be the best model? And isn't it interesting that everybody seems to be mimicking him, but they're not giving credit to who he is. We need to bring him home. I think you're asking a really good question. That's the fundamental question that everybody should ask. How do you define the two religions? And don't define the religions by looking at the people. <laughs> you don't go down the street and say, that's a Christian and that's not true Christianity. Don't look at the people. You need to go back to what motivates the people. You need to go behind the, the people themselves. So I don't sit there and attack Muslims. I, why would I want to? I love them. God bless them. I'm so glad they're doing what they're doing because of the fact that they're following Scripture, that's what you do. You need to go back to the Scripture to define a Muslim. You need to go back to the Scripture to define a Christian. You need to go back to these two books. Mm -hmm. Can you see which is the bigger one? Mm -hmm. There's a reason why it's bigger. Yeah, sure. That's why I keep it bigger. I yeah. always make sure my yeah. Bible's bigger the better because this is the book that we all have to go back to as Christians. Mm -hmm. This is the book the Muslims go back to. And it's when you get back and you do a comparative of these mm -hmm. two books that you then understand why the Muslims are doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Don't blame the Muslims. Blame the book and blame the man behind the yeah. book. Now, the same thing. If a Christian, is a, a Christian comes down the bike and says, I'm a believer in, uh, in Christianity and starts waffling on on things that I've never heard of before, mm -hmm. I want to know where he gets that in scripture. Mm -hmm. We demand that. Jack always does that. Yes. He gets up and he puts the Bible above his head. Remember, remember Billy Graham, he used to hold mm -hmm. the Bible up here. Why? To show that it was not his opinion that mattered, mm -hmm. it was what scripture was saying. He was nothing more than a purveyor of scripture. He was there to communicate scripture so that we could understand it in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what pastors are meant to do. We yeah. demand them to go back to scripture. We demand them to read it, to exegete it, to assimilate it, and to apply it to our lives. Mm -hmm. In the same token, so do Muslims. Sure. And that's why we start yeah. from the same paradigm. So we're very much like them. In some ways, we're just as radical as they are, as uncomfortable as that makes you feel. We are just like a radical Muslim because we go back to the mm -hmm. fundamentals. And the fundamentals can only be found in this book modeled by this man. Now, let's bring the context of peace. See, every Muslim I hear says, well, Islam is a religion of peace. So the first question I ask them is, if you believe Islam is a religion of peace, and I'm sure you are a man of peace, that's not in doubt, because almost every Muslim I meet considers himself to be peaceful. Oh, yeah. I say, show me one verse in this book that supports that. I've been asking this for 33 years. Can you find me one verse in the Quran that says you're to have peace with me, mm -hmm. a Christian? Oh, there are peaceful verses, but they're only for other Muslims. Mm -hmm. They have tried to go to Surah 2, Ayah 256, which says, for there is no compulsion in religion. Take a look at that verse. I remember that was brought up in the House of Lords uh, by Lord Ahmad. He came to me and he talked about it and he said, hold on, we are, what's this problem with? We are people of peace, for there is no compulsion in religion. I raised my hand and I said, Lord Ahmad, can you tell me where that's found? He says, well, I'm not a theologian. I said, then why are you quoting it? Mm -hmm. if, look, it's found in Surah 2, Ayah 256. Read the rest of the verse. Read the verse that comes after it and look at the context and you will see clearly that this has nothing to do with us as Christians, that this is to do with you as a Muslim. And it says very clearly, he who does not follow Allah and he does not follow the prophet, great shall be his perdition, shall he shall be in hell. Mm -hmm. Now tell me if there's no compulsion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then he went to Surah 2, Ayah 190, which I quoted just earlier. If they attack you, don't go beyond the limits. I said, what limits are you not to go beyond? He says, well, I don't know. I said, why don't you read the verse? Read the next verse mm -hmm. and slay them wherever you have. Find them. So then by that time, he jumped to, well, it says in the Quran that he, to, you're to save a life. And he who saves a life is if he saves all lives. And he who uh, takes a life is if he takes the lives of all, of, of all um, uh, Muslims. I said, where is that found? He said, I don't know. I said, let me tell you. That's found in Surah 5, Ayah 32. Have you read the verse? He says, no. I said, why don't you read the first part of the verse? Because the first part of the verse says, O children of Israel, are you a child of Israel? He says, no, well then this has nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. 
So therefore, O children of Israel, he who takes the blood of one, as if he takes the blood of all, he who saves the blood of one, as if he saves the blood of all, that's talking about verse 31, which is talking about Cain and Abel. Cain kills his brother Abel, doesn't know what to do with his brother, he follows the example of a raven, and then it talks about the blood of Abel. That's for Jews, it's nothing to do with Muslims. Mm -hmm. But the next verse that follows is to do with Islam, verse 33. That it says, he who mocks the prophet, or confronts the prophet, or confronts Allah, take them and cut off their hands and feet from other, uh, opposite sides and crucify them. That's what uh, you're supposed to apply. You should apply the verse that follows it. That's what you're to do if you confront Allah and his prophet. Now tell me if that's peaceful. Now, the, the, the core elements for both Islam and Christianity, as I've been saying, you probably get nauseated with me saying it over and over again, it's the book of the man, the book of the man, the book of the man. It always comes back to the Bible and the Quran and Jesus and Muhammad. You've got to come back to those two things because that's what forms us. Without the Bible and without Jesus, we're nothing. Without the Quran, without the Muhammad, Islam is nothing. Therefore, you've got to come back to those two and that's why we need to unpack them. Let's do a comparison like with like. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the book and the book on each category. Let's look at the Quran and the Bible. When you look at these two books, you will see immediately they're completely different books. Mm -hmm. There's, that, that should, nobody should have been in doubt of that. This book here is ulta puta, as we say in India. That means it's all over the place. Try to see if you can find one complete story in this book. Every story in the Quran does not begin, nor does it end. One story does not follow another, which seems to suggest that it's borrowed from many different sources. And that's exactly what we now know. Most of the stories of the biblical stories, the biblical characters like Abraham or Abraham, Ibrahim or Adama, Adam or Yahya, John the Baptist or Issa, Jesus, every one of these stories are found in apocryphal writings. We can trace every one of them back to Jewish apocryphal accounts. They're not the real stories. They have nothing to do with Judaism. The Jews had completely rejected them. They were nothing than fairy tales for their children in bedtime stories, yet they find their way into the Quran. If you want to get the real stories, come back to this book. These are the real stories with the real historical Abraham, the historical David, the historical Jesus, and the story, historical John the Baptist. That's why it's so much better to come back to the Bible. I've got it upside down. Let's get it right side up. Come back to the real book with the real stories. And it's interesting that the Quran did not pick up these stories. Why did the Quran not follow these stories? For one very simple reason. The Bible had not been translated into Arabic until the late 8th century. Therefore, whoever had access, whoever put this book together in the late seventh to the beginning of the eighth century did not have the Bible to refer to. They only had these apocryphal accounts. And the sectarian stories of Jesus, all of them are from the Nag Hammadi, the Syriac stories. That's why the name Issa is the wrong name. Jesus is the wrong Jesus. Issa is not Arabic. Yeshua is the name for Jesus in Arabic. Why didn't the Quran get it right? And who in the world is Issa? Where did that name come from? It came from these stories, these Syriac stories, about Jesus in his childhood. They're almost stories about his childhood. Every one of them has the reference to him as Iesu in Syriac. If you borrow the story, you borrow the name. When you take Iesu and put it into Arabic, it becomes Issa. Ooh, doo -doo -doo. They've got the wrong Jesus. They've got a Syriac Jesus. They've got a Gnostic Jesus, a Jesus who does not, has nothing to do with God, who doesn't die on the cross. Can you then understand, not only do they have the wrong Jesus, they got the wrong God. We've already talked about the God being wrong. So is Jesus wrong. That all proves that the book is wrong. They've got the wrong book. They've got the wrong bag. They've got the wrong man at the wrong time doing the wrong thing. And of course, we've got the right man at the right time doing the right thing. Well, I think the first thing you do, you need a, there is so much material out in the Bible. Listen, this book has been attacked since the 1800s. Mm -hmm. There in Germany, in Tübingen, this mm -hmm. university in Tübingen, with people like Wellhausen, he started attacking the Bible, and he needed to do that. They're looking at what we call redacted criticism, mm -hmm. source criticism. Uh, we have certainly literary criticism, higher and lower historical criticism. All these criticisms were legitimate. They had to be asked. Sure. Every one of those criticisms have now been answered. Because by 1905, mm -hmm. when this really was took over by the early, early 20th century, 1905, it decimated the church both historical criticism and Darwinianism destroyed the church and the church has never recovered in Europe. Since that time we've done our homework and that's why if you come to the Brit London and come to the British Museum, God bless the British because they stole everything and put it into one building so we could look at it and if you look at that building you will find artifact after artifact, stella and murals and tablets, all of them talking about these people, these dates, these events. We have in almost every case we can now pretty much support 
First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Samuel, the Book of Daniel, the Book of Jeremiah, even much of the Book of Genesis, just from the artifacts we have found, mm -hmm. proving we've got the right man at the right place doing the right thing at the right time. That's how great our Bible is. In fact, today they can't find one artifact anywhere in the world that controverts a properly understood biblical statement. That's the beauty of our Bible. Mm -hmm. So we've done our homework. Mm -hmm. We're a hundred years later. Now for the first time we're doing the same study, source criticism, mm -hmm. redacted criticism on the Quran, and we're just destroying the Quran. We don't have time to show you what we now know. Yeah. In just the last two years what we have found about that book. Mm -hmm. But we're, every book that claims to be from God, and that concludes the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, then uh, Grant Sahib for the Sikhs, any of the Book of Mormons, all of them have to pass the historical test. So far, only the Bible has passed that test. Mm -hmm. We're the only book that passed every historical criticism. That's the beauty of the Bible. Come on home. Well, I got to tell you, this kind of information, quite frankly, you can't get anywhere else. Now, let me be honest. If you Google right now or YouTube J. Smith's name, what do you think you're going to find? You are going to find an onslaught of slander and attacks. Why? Well, because Jay has hit the nail on the head, and you and I live in a culture that cannot handle truth. And yet, I'm so glad that doesn't uh, cause Jay to back up. In fact, what Jay does is step forward, challenging you to know the truth. Listen, friends, it's time for us to really buck up and get strong and to know what truth is and not listen to the spin that's around us. The Bible tells us that in the last days, false doctrines would advance, that there would be doctrines of demons in fact, Paul the Apostle said, even if an angel came from heaven and preached any other gospel than that which they have preached or the apostles have preached, let them be accursed. So think about it. What came first? The Old Testament or Islam? Jesus being born in Bethlehem, the ministry of Christ or Muhammad? The gospel being preached to the ends of the earth or the Quran? Think about it. Islam is a late comer, and yet it stands and says that it's always been. Not true. Do you know the truth? Jay is committed to having you know the truth, as we are here at Real Life. Listen, we're going to ask you to go to his website. You can find out so much more. There's apologetic courses there. There's many links whereby you can become more familiar with Jay Smith and his great ministry to the world. But more than ever, it's time for you to know the truth because, listen, Islam is in your neighborhood. Chances are you know a Muslim. They don't know Islam like you do now after hearing Jay. And Jay's commitment is lovingly, passionately geared to exposing the fallacies of Islam and its soon death. That's right, Islam is going to die soon. This cult has no promise. This cult has no Bible. Islam is going to go down because it's not based on truth. Those days are coming. So friends, be equipped and be ready to give an answer to every Muslim that asks you, why is it that you're a Christian? Until next time here at Real Life, we're just hoping that you continue on with your walk with Jesus and with knowing his word more.